Father, we praise you and we thank you for your precious word. And Father, we thank you that the presence of your Holy Spirit is here. And your angels are around and about us. And we thank you, Father, that even as your word is ministered to tonight, even as your word is ministered to tonight, that you will continue, O oh God, that you will continue, O oh God, to establish your word in our hearts, in our minds. And Father, you know our needs. You know, Lord, the physical needs here, needs in the soul and needs in the spirit. And we ask, O oh God, that by your grace and by the power of your spirit, and in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will stretch out your mighty hand in our midst. That as your word is spoken, let healing come forth. Let the gifts of the Spirit pour forth upon your people. And cause, O oh God, redemption to be magnified. And cause, O oh God, deliverance to flow forth. As your word is spoken, let the voice of the living God be heard. And let the word go forth like a two-edged sword, cutting asunder, dividing, O oh God, those things that are like in darkness and breaking bondages and causing deliverance to flow forth. And let your healing word flow forth. And those who need direction, O oh God, let them hear your voice through your spoken word. And we promise, O oh God, that in all that you do, we give you all the glory, all the worship, and all the honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The book of Zechariah it has 14 chapters, and we're going to divide it into two major sections. The first part, from chapter 1 to chapter 7, we consider the visions of Zechariah. And they uh, are... Altogether about eight visions. Some people say that there are six because they group them together. Others say there are seven. But you could divide them into about seven or eight visions altogether. From chapter 1 to chapter 7. And then from chapter 8 to chapter 14. There is a, an eschatological prophecy about the nation of Israel. And all the promises that God has and God wants to fulfill in their lives. And of course, here and there in the eschatological prophecies, that includes some verses on the first coming, and some verses, most of the verses are on the second coming of Jesus. Of all the minor prophets, Zechariah moves quite deep into some things that the book of Revelation touches on. While all the other minor prophets, excluding the major prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel, of all the, all the minor prophets, Zechariah moves into a gap of the book of Revelation, so that I would say that without the book of Zechariah, certain parts of the book of Revelation will be quite hard to understand. And the book of Revelation contains many mysteries. And we need keys to unlock those mysteries. And among them, of course, we have the teachings of Jesus, the prophecies of Daniel, and uh, besides that, we need the small little keys or clues that the book of Zechariah provides to enable us to understand the book of Revelation. So tonight, we will do a lot of cross-reference into the book of Revelation. And uh, let's look at the visions of Zechariah. First of all, the Bible introduces also the fact that he is in chapter 1, verse 1. He is in chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, okay, the echo is coming from this mic. If we can off this mic, uh, the echo will stop. Thank you. And uh, he said here in chapter 1, verse 1, that... Uh, in the eighth month of the second year of the Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido the prophet, 
saying. Sometimes he is known as Zechariah, the son of Ido. In case you do not pay much attention when you book, read, read the book of uh, Ezra, chapter 5, verse 1, or chapter 6, verse 14, you notice that he is known as Zechariah, the son of Ido. But here in Zechariah chapter 1 verse 1, he said that he is Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido. So whose son is he? <laughs> well, it's a very simple uh, thing to solve. It is said that uh, his real father is Berechiah, but uh, Berechiah died quite early, and Ido, Ido uh, brought him up. And so he is known in his adulthood as the son of Ido. Besides that, Zechariah lived in the time of the post-exilic period when they have returned from their captivity. Thousands of Jews returned under the edict of Cyrus and there was the first batch and several other batches that came in. And it was a time when uh, Haggai had prophesied, also he and Haggai were contemporaries. And uh, during the return, they established uh, Jerusalem, and they established the walls of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem and the suburbs, and also they were seeking to build a temple. Now Zechariah came to prophesy a few months after Haggai, and immediately, Zechariah was a different kind of prophet altogether. Zechariah was a wish, visual prophet. Most of his prophecies are contained within a vision. And we consider the visions of Zechariah. His first vision is found in the uh, 1 verse 7. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shibat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, the prophet. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the middle trees, in the hollow and behind him were horses, red, sorrow, and white. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. And he exp the angel explained some details of what the horses are. But let's just outline the first seven chapters. The first vision is a vision of the horse. The second vision is in verse 18. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. Then he asked the angel what the four horns were. The second vision was the vision of the four horns. In chapter 2, verse 1, his third vision. Then I raised my eyes. He's always raising his eyes all the time. <laughs> Then I raised my eyes, and he saw, and he looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand, a plumb line. And uh, that's the third vision, the vision of the measuring plumb line. In chapter 3, verse 1, the fourth vision. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. That's the fourth vision. Then in chapter 4 verse 1, the fifth vision. The angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who's wakened out of his sleep. So he's raising his eyes all the time until he fell under the power. He's deep in spirit. And here comes the angel, I don't know why he... Between when to when he fell asleep in the spirit, which some people do when they read the Old Testament. <laughs> the only difference is that guy has visions and they have snores. <laughs> verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, and he wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And this time he says, 
I see a lampstand. So we have all together now one, two, three, four, the fifth vision. Then in chapter five, verse one, the sixth vision. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. That's the sixth vision. The seventh vision in verse 5. Leave up your eyes now and see what this is that goes. And then it is a basket that was flying about. That's the seventh vision. Then we have the eighth vision. In chapter 6 verse 1. Then I turn and raise my eyes and look and behold four chariots are coming from between two mountains and the mountains were mountains of bronze. And uh, that's the last and eighth vision. If you are a Bible student and you read commentaries on that, you'll find that some people cluster some of the visions together. Like J. Cyril Baxter says that they're actually uh, six and some say that there are seven and uh, all together there are actually eight descriptions whatever you want to call it and so we divide the eight into eight visions for reasons that we will show afterwards it seems that he received all these eight visions in one go it all happened it possibly happened all in the same day and he, he must be very deep in the spirit that day. And in one, one panoramic show, God, God gave him the entire history of Israel uh, with part of the church involved. As we have said, sometimes the Christian doesn't see the value of the Old Testament. And they say the Old Testament is the new concealed and the new is the old revealed. There are elements of truth buried deep in the soil of the Old Testament. And we need the state of the Holy Spirit to dig out the nuggets of gold to show how it applies to the New Testament. In fact, these eight visions are a chronological order of the last things. They are a chronological order of some things that will take place in the last days both in the church and in the nation of Israel, uh, which will be fulfilling the last seven weeks of what we call Daniel's last week. In fact, the book of Zechariah of all the minor prophets speak the most about what will happen in the last seven weeks. Uh, the last week, that is, the last seven days, the last week of Daniel. Now let's look at the first vision and see... A prophecy about what will happen in the days before the Antichrist comes. In the days of what we call the last days of the church. The last hours of the church. It is said here in the first vision, the vision of the horses. The, white ho the red horse, the sorrow and the white horse. In uh, chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. What do these horses represent? They are not the same horses as the book of uh, Revelations. Because the book of Revelations, when they broke the seal, and the horses started coming forth, one by one, as each seal was broken, the horses brought war, pestilence, and famine. The chapter in the book of Revelations that we are, we, we are talking about is in chapter 6. When the seals were broken, there were horses that came out in the, in the spirit realm. They were manifested. And uh, the horses in chapter 6 are, are not good horses. They represent destructive forces. In the book of Revelation chapter 6, the first white horse that comes is not Jesus Christ. It's different from the other white horse in Revelation 19. The White House in Revelation 6 is the rise of the Antichrist. And then it talks about the uh, conflict that will take place on the earth, and uh, famine, and widespread death that comes. However, the horses that were manifested in Zechariah's time are horses of peace. Horses that bring peace, horses that bring prosperity. Look at the context. 
In chapter 1 of Zechariah, the man who ride on the horse replied and said in verse 11, They answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the middle trees and said, We have walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. Of course, we realize that there is a historical fulfillment of some of these scriptures. But because of uh, lack of time and we got so much to cover in the eschatological area, we leave the historical because the historical is very obvious. Like, for example, Zechariah was concerned about uh, Israel. How, how will God treat Israel now that Israel is restored in, uh, in a post-exilic period? And uh, he's wondering, Oh God, where is your mercy for Israel that you promised after these 70 years? So all those are historical fulfillments. But there's an eschatological prophetic significance that is coming forth. Look at what the horses uh, bring forth. He says here uh, in verse 16, Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, hosts, My cities shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. And the horses, the riders on the horses says, the earth is resting quietly. So the first things that will happen as we draw near the last days is a peaceful period. The Antichrist will not come immediately as a, as a man of war. He, he will rise and seek to be the man of peace that will be uh, trying to restore world, global uh, unity. And so, even before he arises, the Bible seems to point to a period of time <coughs> that as he draw near, there seems to be a conflicting eschatological prophecy. On the one hand, on one hand, our prophecies that say in the last days there will be wars, rumors of wars, and all these things taking place as Matthew 24 describes. But if you study Matthew 24 very carefully, you will notice that Jesus especially was talking about the Jewish dispensation and not the church dispensation. Although some passages apply to both. Notice in Matthew 24, verse 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. But the end is not yet. Says in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And remember that background, sometimes you've got to repeat because sometimes a person, uh, you're just new and this is the first time you hear about prophecy. And uh, so just let me, uh, give me permission to just read a few scriptures on Daniel, the book of Daniel. And, uh, <clears throat> Chapter 8, verse 24, talking about the Antichrist. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper, and thrive. Now when the Antichrist rises, the evil seems to prosper at first. Now Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. The horns are ten kings who shall rise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them, though another refers to Antichrist. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings, shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. So 
So it seems, including from the book of uh, Revelations, turn over to the book of Revelations. We see in chapter 18, the fall of the city called Babylon. Revelations 18. Now before the fall, there must be a rise. And we know obviously that the city of Babylon referred to in chapter 17 and 18 is not Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom because that was past history even in John, the John, Apostle John's time. So there was a prophetic type about the last day empire of the Antichrist. I noticed that in chapter 17, before the fall of Babylon was the prosperity of Babylon. There is, a, there is a prosperity and a rise of the ten nations. Now during the rise of the ten nations, we said that the ten nations will rise before the, the Antichrist rise. And the ten, ten nations are different from the, from the empire of the Antichrist. They are separated in the book of Daniel chapter 7. Because in Daniel chapter 7 it says the ten, ten horns are the ten nations. And it says that uh, after that another will rise. Now the another is a little horn that was the Antichrist. So there was a chronological time period between the rise of ten horns and the rise of the Antichrist, a little horn that conquered three. During the rise of the ten nations, there will be a pe period of peace and prosperity. And that period is what Zechariah speaks about. The period when he says the earth is resting. This when baby long goes rich. See in, in Revelation 17 verse 4 he says, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. And although there was corruption there, yet there was that riches that were adorning the mystery baby lawn in Revelation 17. Now what we are pointing to is here that when we talk about peace coming out in the last days, examine closely those scriptures that talk about war coming out in the last days. When Jesus talked about war in Matthew 24, He says, but this is not the end yet. Of course, war will take place to a certain extent. It seems that the history of mankind, uh, as far as recorded history is concerned, has been war and peace, war and peace, war and peace all the time. Although we Christians have a responsibility given to us in Second Timothy chapter 1 to always pray for peace. Because we are in the church age and we have to pray for peace and the gospel, remember our gospel that was given when Jesus Christ was born on this earth, it was said, peace on earth and goodwill to all men. So our gospel is a gospel of peace. It's called a gospel of peace in the book of in the Gospels, Gospel of Peace. And uh, so we have to pray for peace. Why peace? Because we need peace for the Gospel to go forth. It is what we call church age. The church age. So there will be in the rise of the ten horns. Let's put our marking down here. Let's say that this uh, pulpit here right in the, in the center represents the beginning. The beginning of... Uh, the, the the rapture taking place right right in this place at the pulpit here and uh, towards your right here will be the period of pre-rapture and then uh, the the position here after towards your left here uh, will be the period after the rapture now what will happen is the Bible tells us that when the rapture takes place the Antichrist manifests and the Antichrist, when he manifests, the ten, 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 ten nations or ten kingdoms will already be there. When the Antichrist rises at the exact point that the rapture takes place, the ten nations should have already been formed. Because he's supposed to conquer them. How can he conquer that which was not formed? So that means that during the pre-rapture time, we will see, we may not get to see the Antichrist. And we, the Bible shows that we don't get to see him because he is in the other period, not in this period. 
He's in the period after that. Now, the spirit of Antichrist is working. Now, we realize that he may be in existence before the rapture. But his manifestation will be only after the rapture. But before the rapture, pre-rapture, there will be the rise of the ten nations. And the rise of the ten nations is a prosperous period. It's a prosperous period. And that's what Zechariah points to in the last days. There is a prosperous period. Now, when we apply the prophecy to the Jews, which was basically also to them, the first period, during these seven weeks, from here, this point of pulpit, right up to your left side here, is what we call uh, <clears throat> the seven weeks of, the seven weeks of, uh, the seven days of Daniel. The last week of Daniel. Now, this seven days represent seven years and is divided in the middle three and a half here and three and a half there the first three and a half years of the last week of Daniel for the Jews are prosperous years also so you can see the door fulfillment the first three and a half years for the Jews are reasonably prosperous because the Antichrist comes to them as the false messiah and then establish his headquarters in Jerusalem and the, and the abomination of desolation only takes place where? remember the Bible? in the middle of the last week and the middle means three and a half years so it's only in the middle of the three and a half year, in the middle of the last week, that what we call, Jesus calls, the abomination of desolation takes place. So during, during the first three and a half years, there will be, in, incidentally, there will be wars going on, because the Antichrist will be conquering the ten, ten horns. There will be wars going on because the Antichrist will be conquering more and more of uh, the... Uh, the, his empire as the Bible prophesied but during that time the Jews in that dispensation have great prosperity there will be wars rumors of wars there will be famine sickness here and there but as far as Israel is concerned there will be prosperity which will fulfill what Isaiah says that, that, that prosper, prosperous spirit that many of the other prophets are prophesying will take place it's all going to take place within the first three and a half. So you can see the similar pattern. We in the church age, as we draw near to the time of the ten nations coming, coming forth, or the ten kingdoms or ten confederations coming forth, there is a period of peace and prosperity. The horses are at rest. And over here, they also have a type of peace here in the first three and a half. Now let's look at the next vision. So it's a chronological period that Zechariah brings up. The next vision shows off. The next thing that will take place. <clears throat> it says in verse 18, I saw four horns. Now why do we put these eight visions chronologically in, in an order? Because they all happen in one one occasion, one leading to another, one after the other. All possibly in one day he received all the eight visions. He saw the four horns. Who do these four horns represent? These four horns represent nations that have come against Israel in the, ta in the, in the uh, days, historical days of Zechariah. It says here in uh, verse uh, 19, Zechariah says, uh, What are these? So he answered, He answered me, These are the horns, all nations, that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. These are the nations. And uh, you realize he's talking about the Babylonian kingdom, he's talking about the Syrian kingdom, and uh, he's talking about the uh, Assyrian kingdom 
and uh, all these nations and uh, there you also the middle Persian part and, uh, and of course if it's eschatological, if it's historical, it will only refer to those nations. If it is eschatological, it will refer to four nations that will rise and come against the futuristic Israel. To Zechariah futuristic, to us here in history, histor uh, present. Because we live long many many years from Zechariah. Israel was scattered in AD 70 when General Titus took over Jerusalem and the Roman Empire just destroyed the whole of Jerusalem in fulfillment uh, partially of what Jesus prophesied would happen uh, about the stones of the temple all being uh, destroyed the second temple being destroyed and uh, so then it points to the eschatological return, which in 1948 Israel returned. And therefore, as Israel come together as a nation, when it, when it revert back to the Jewish dispensation, the Jews will also be having, uh, we, even during this period, pre-rapture and, uh, and uh, post-rapture, there will be nations that will come against Israel more and more. And whoever those four horns are, the second prophecy will also be fulfilled eschatologically as well as historically for Zechariah. Eschatologically for the nation of Israel, but there, there will be the second period. During the time of prosperity in the first three and a half years, there will be a shaking of those nations that have come against Israel. So the second thing that takes place is a shaking. Now, in the church age, what is taking place here? The, the period, the first period is what I call prosperous years that come about. And then, somewhere in the midst or in the depths of the prosperous years, there will be a sudden change. So, second thing that takes place, there will be a shaking taking place. What is talking about in the second vision is there will be a shaking. And all this is pre-rapture. When you have turned prophecies to the church, it's pre-rapture. There will be a shaking taking place. And that is promised in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 26 and 27. Whose voice then shook the earth. Hebrews 12, verse 26 27. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake, not only the earth, but also heaven. Yet once more indicates the removal of things that are being shaken, as of things that are made. That the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving, we are receiving, and we are going to manifestly receive the kingdom. He says, uh, a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. So there is, as we have pointed out in the book of Haggai last week, we said that there is a shaking going to take place in the church age. In Haggai chapter 2 verse 21, which referred to the church age shaking. And then there is a shaking taking place in Haggai chapter 2 verse 7, which refers to the, to the shaking that takes place uh, as far as the nation of Israel is concerned and its surrounding nations. So there are two separate shakings that is taking place. Hope you are not shaken. <laughs> so here are the second thing that takes place. After the prosperous period. Now I sense that we, have, we are somewhere here. We have crossed into the area that I call the Feast of Trumpets. And uh, we are moving into the period of peace and prosperity where the earth is going to rest. But somewhere along there, perhaps at the end of this decade, perhaps immediately after, after the end of this decade, perhaps some years after this decade, we do not know and we don't want to speculate. But the Bible says that there will be a great period of prosperity and rest for the earth. And then there will be a great shaking that will come. And all this pre-rapture for the church.
where those things that are not established on the word will be shaken. That's what Paul talked about falling away first, if you remember. Then the third vision, in chronological order, in chapter 2, he saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. What does that line represent in that third vision? Notice here, it says in verse 6. Uh, verse 5, verse 6. I will be like a wall of fire all around me. Now, that's a good promise to claim. The Lord is a wall of fire about you. You can personalize it. And I will be the glory in her midst. Verse 6. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord. For I have spread abroad, I spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven. Now we all know what a historical fulfillment is. The historical fulfillment in Zechariah's time is that God is telling them to all leave Middle Persian Empire and follow the edict of King Cyrus and all return to that nation. That God wanted them to return. So there's a historical fulfillment. The eschatological fulfillment is in the church age, there will come a time of evangelizing. Worldwide evangelizing. In the eschatological fulfillment of the Jewish dispensation, there will also be a period of worldwide evangelization. Because during that first during that period of the uh, three and a half years here, there will be, there will be what we call uh, the two witnesses arise. Together we remember the 144,000. And they go about all the earth evangelizing and speaking about Yahweh God. It's a Jewish dispensation there. And so we see the progression involved. Incidentally, the pre-rapture, those three things are also taking place right now simultaneously in Israel. Because Israel has already been formed in 1948 and we are already living post-Israel formation. And so during the first period of prosperity, Israel will keep on getting prosperous. It will continue to keep on getting prosperous. And then during the period of shaking as a church, Church has been shaken and surrounding things have been shaken. So there will also be a shaking. And the third area here, as there is world evangelization, there will also be, to a certain end, uh, many Jews who turn to the Lord in the last day of revival also. And they may get in under the church age and not under the Jewish dispensation. But for the church age, which we are most concerned with, the third vision represents worldwide evangelization. Look at it, it says here in uh, verse 9. Surely, chapter 2 verse 9. Surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that a lot of hosts have sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people. What is he talking about? That, that plumb line, that measuring line. Normally you use that plumb line when you want to build something. You want to extend a building. You want to do something that's the old fashioned way of doing a plumb line. So that, that represents an expansion that's taking place. And that will take place in the church here. There will be a worldwide evangelization that takes place immediately after the uh, shaking. And uh, then the fourth vision. Chapter 3, the vision of Joshua the high priest. There was a historical fulfillment in that it was a real person named Joshua and, uh, and, and Zechariah had a word for him. But those of you who may not be familiar with the Bible way of prophecy, think not of the fact that it's marvelous how when Abraham went to sacrifice his son Isaac, it, it, it was a, a perfect pictorial example of Jesus Christ represented by Isaac dying for the sins of the world. And yet for Abraham it was a real struggle in story. I mean it, it was not just play acting and drama. It was real. God did tell him to bring the son out. 
How marvelous the ways of God that human lives become prophetic. So in the same way, when Zechariah had a word historically for Joshua the high priest, who was the name of that person at that time, there was a historical fulfillment to encourage them as they were building the temple. At the same time, Joshua the high priest represents Jesus, our high priest. It also represents, of course, as I mentioned in the book of Haggai, uh, as we bring it forth into Haggai, what Zerubbabel representing the church and Joshua representing the restoration of the Jewish temple worship. Uh, here we see in chapter 3, verse 1, He showed me Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing in his, at his right hand to oppose him. Now that Joshua represents Jesus, our head and the body of Christ. It's all filthy and dirty. That is a powerful prophecy. It has a multiple fulfillment. It's a multiple fulfillment of, of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sin. It's a multiple fulfillment of the historical fulfillment in Zechariah of Joshua the high priest. It's a multiple fulfillment also of the church. But Jesus is the head, we are his body. So we are in him, there is all the rags and the dirt there. And just before the wedding day of the rapture, we are going to be clothed with glory from on high. Now that fourth vision is the last day glory that will come forth. Where Satan himself will personally try to challenge the church. And the church will be clothed with power from on high. A special dispensation. And in one day, now that one day could represent a short period of time for the church. But that one day, that one day, he is going to rapture the church at the last hour of that one day. The church age is measured in hours. The Jewish age is measured in days. Prophetically speaking. And so it says here, in verse 8 and 9, it's obvious that Joshua the high priest represents Jesus. Verse 9, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon the stone are seven eyes. I represent again the church age. Seven spirits of God. Turn to Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. And I look and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world. The Lamb that was slain, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So the fourth vision represents the last day revival. Now don't be too concerned. You say, what? You mean revival for the church? The most powerful, only one day. <laughs> that one day has been a long one. Remember what Peter says in Acts 2? And in the last days, God will pour His Spirit. Look at it, we are still in the last days after 2,000 years. <laughs> you are familiar with prophecy, the church age is measured in days and hours. The Jewish dispensation is measured in weeks and in days. So here we are in the last day. Peter was talking about last days. This Zechariah fourth vision is about the last day. You know what I believe the last day? The last day is the last the last day began at the beginning of the twentieth century. When God started pouring out the Holy Spirit and preparing the church. And that last day revival, the Pentecostal revival that was released, 
He said, why didn't I include the Reformation? Because we have to be scriptural. They started in Acts 2 with an outpouring and speaking in tongues. And there were many moves and revival. Great men of God, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, and uh, Charles G. Finney. But our century is significant. It's possibly, possibly, the last century, last great century of a hundred years that men will see. I believe we will live past 2080, right? Don't, don't get too worried. Last century, wow. Some of you are thinking, what to do? Like some heretic somewhere, you know, saying that Jesus is going to come in September, don't know when and when. <laughs> Gets everybody packing. There's a heretic there. And uh, we, we, we will possibly live past it, and no man knows the hour or the day. So don't try to speculate. But we do know that it definitely cannot be another hundred years. <laughs> it's very long for that time. And it looks like we are, we, it will possibly be less than that, of course. And we will possibly cross the 2,000 year mark. But we have entered the last day. The last day has begun. And the clock is now going by the hour. And each hour is like each move of God. Each hour was like several decades. And then we have several types of revival that come to the church. We have the Pentecostal revival that came. We have the Charismatic revival that came. We have the, the Word revival that came. We have the Healing revival that came. We have all kinds of revival that are happening all within one century. Never before in the history of the church. And so in the last hour of the last day, last hours could mean decade, a decade or two, that we enter into the last great move of God, the last one. And after the fourth vision is fulfilled, in that one day, as, jo as Joshua the high priest is cloth, the church will be wretched. And all the other visions apply to the Jews. By the fourth vision, the rapture is taking, has taken place and we are here. In the, in the, at, at the area that we have divided chronologically along the platform here, right in the poopy area. The rapture. Now for the, church, for the, for the Jews, the fourth vision represents the complete restoration of the temple worship. Do you know that up to today, they have not built their third temple yet? The first temple was built by Solomon. The second temple was built by Ezra, renovated by Herod and then called Herod's temple, but destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. And the third temple has never been built. Jewish sacrificial worship as a following the Mosaic law has never been restored ever since 1948 when they came together. And what the Bible predicts, all this may, will take place P, possibly, or just post, slightly after post. Rapture. The restoration of Joshua the priest to the Jews. See, in that first vision, there are four, four, four fulfillments. One historical, and uh, in, in Zechariah's time, and one in Jesus, uh, uh, number two, in uh, Jesus dying on the cross, taking our sins. And number three, in the church age. Number four, in the Jewish age. In that one vision. We have here, in the Jewish age, in Joshua being clothed, the third temple being formed, all the sacrifices all being formed. If you read current uh, developments, they have even tried to produce what they have called the red heifer. Because it has gone out and they are trying to genetically produce it for the day that they have the third temple built. It's remarkable. The events are leading towards that. And uh, that will be the fourth vision for the Jews. For the church fourth vision, we are taken up. 
Now, from that point onward, we will have to work together with the book of Revelation for clarity of this book. It's a marvelous book once you understand the book of Zechariah. So you need to have one finger on Zechariah and the other on Revelation. Just for brief knowledge of Revelation, later on we'll teach in detail. Chapter 2 and 3 is still the church age. And if you divide the book of Revelation also chronologically in order, Chapter 4, in chapter 4, verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. So chapter 4 concludes definitely a, a movement. In the book of Revelation, there are several movements. And at the end of each movement, the scene is in heaven, and the, the angels and the elders are worshipping in heaven. If you ever read the book of Revelation, there is like a song. There is many movements. It's just like when we sing a hymn uh, or a song, you have the stanza, then you go to the chorus, then you have another stanza, then you go to the chorus, and another stanza, then you go to the chorus, and then maybe you got four stanzas, you go to the fourth stanza, then you go to the chorus. The book of Revelation is like that. You have the stanzas, then the chorus. The chorus is when you see the heaven, heavenly vision and they're always singing hallelujah to the Lamb and, and the heavenly and they're worshipping. Then it comes down again, some more things happen. Then it goes up again, oh they're doing all kinds of things. Those are the choruses in the book of Revelation. It's like a big song. And in chapter 4, it's like the end of the first stanza. And they're not singing the chorus. In chapter 4, and many scholars agree, that's where the church got raptured. So chapter 5, all those things are taking place in heaven. And in chapter 6, begins the last week of Daniel. The last seven years. So from chapter 6 onwards, it's Jewish dispensation in the book of Revelation. So you begin to see the two types and follow along. And... Uh, so just as uh, the fourth vision of Zechariah ends in a rapture, chapter 4 of Revelation ends in a rapture. And chapter 5 are activities that took place in heaven, or the book of Revelation. That means that the fourth vision begins the Jewish dispensation. Uh, the, the fifth vision begins the Jewish dispensation in the book of Zechariah. Now back to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. He saw a vision of the lampstand and the olive trees. As we said, we could apply it in three ways. The fifth vision. We're talking about the fifth vision. Have you got it? Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. Okay. It says here, verse 2. What do you see? I'm looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold, a bowl on top and... Uh, understand seven lambs, seven parts to the seven lambs. Verse 3, two olive trees are by it, one on the right of the bowl, the other on the left. Three fulfillments. Number one, historical. The two olive branches, olive trees that is, represent Shua and Zerubbabel who were alive in Zechariah's time. And so his prophecy historical to encourage them to keep building the temple. They are like the two anointed ones of God in Zechariah's time. And they must be encouraged to finish the building of the temple and the leading of God's people. So the historical fulfillment is already taken place in Zechariah's time. The two olive trees represent uh, what we call Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest. Then the, the church fulfillment that we apply in the book of Haggai is where the two olive trees can be represented as given in the book of Romans that there is a wild olive and there is an original olive. The wild olive represents the church and the, the, the original olive represents the nation of Israel. And how we, the wild olive branches, were, were grafted into the olive tree. And so there is a, there is a church representation and teaching. But remember that everything in the Bible after uh, Zechariah chapter 4 eschatologically applied to 
the Jewish dispensation, but the principles can still always apply to the church. Remember that. That's why we can have uh, 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 ask the Lord for rain in the time or day of the latter rain. All those can still apply. So the principles can still apply. But the actual eschatological fulfillment now began to directly apply to the Jewish dispensation. And so the two olive branches, number the sect is fulfillment is that they represent, they could represent the nation of Israel and the church. The third fulfillment, which is the eschatological true fulfillment, is the two olive branches, olive trees, represent the two witnesses that were come during the first three and a half years. The moment Antichrist is manifest, God also makes sure there are two manifested prophets coming about. Because they still need a voice. And in chapter 4, in verse 12, Zechariah further asks, What are these two olive branches that drop into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which are the golden, uh, the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Who are these two anointed ones? As we say, there are three historical of fulfill three fulfillment. One historical, one ecclesiastical, and one uh, uh, an Israel Israelite fulfillment, which is the true actual one. In the book of Revelation, Chapter 11, verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Now, isn't that reference direct? It is a precise, exact fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 4. You can't run away from that. And these two olive trees are described just as in Zeru, uh, Zechariah's time they have Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest strengthening the people in the first restoration in the time of the first three and a half years of the last week of Daniel God puts two of his prophets there the two anointed ones they will stand and strengthen the nation of Israel. While the false Messiah tries to come, the two prophets will keep warning the people. And so in chapter 11, it says in verse 3, I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, which is divided by 363 and a half. Three and a half years. And it says in verse 6, These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy and their power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. These are the two prophets. One of them definitely is Elijah. The other is a subject of great debate by scholars. Uh, some things is Moses. Some think it is Enoch, and some think that it's John the Baptist, which is the most weakest argument. We will not go into that until we reach the book of Revelation. But just to let you know, I lean towards the Enoch group. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so, well. It's no point trying to start a different denomination by saying I'm in the Enoch group, you're the Elijah group, and start different denominations. These are things that are not, not essential. I mean, these things are going to take place after the rapture. <laughs> or these are going to take place in the tribulation. Even that Christians quarrel because some of them want to go to the rapture. Uh, they, want to go, they want to be tribulated here in the seven years. Uh, but it's all right. I mean, since it's something futuristic and doesn't concern that much in a Christian life, except that if a knowledge helps us, uh, it's not, 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 not necessary to quarrel about, we can disagree without being disagreeable. 
To disagree is to discuss facts. To be disagreeable has to do with our attitude. We have to approach it with the right attitude. We have to permit disagree, uh, people to disagree. And now, uh, but basically it is settled that there will be two witnesses raised, two prophets. And they will be functioning in the first three and a half years of the first part of the seven years. And they will stand against the Antichrist and they cannot be killed until the three and a half years are up and the desolation and of abomination is about to be shown. And because of their ministry, the 144,000 will be raised. 144,000 Israelites. A lot of Christians and some, some cults think that they try to make it among 144,000. Read carefully, they are all 12,000 from each tribe of the Jews. It's not a Gentile dispensation or even a church dispensation. It is a Jewish dispensation. There are the 144,000 chosen witnesses to go about all the earth that God will raise in that time. So that is the fifth vision. So that is the fifth vision. The two olive branches. You can see how systematic it flows. The eight visions. Now in chapter 5, chapter 5 of Zechariah that is, because we have both Revelation and Zechariah, some of you are turning all over the place now. <laughs> Zechariah is on page 991 if you are using the same Bible as me. <laughs> now, your Bible may be different. Now, turn to Zechariah chapter 5 verse 1 again. Put your hand on Revelation so you can get it easily. Zechariah chapter 5 verse 1. This is an important one. This is the one thing, this is the one fifth vision. Is it the fifth? The, the sixth vision that helps us interpret certain parts of vision. So let's read chapter 5, the first few verses, because it's a very short vision. It is one of the most important, although shortly described. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. Now most scrolls contain uh, good news, but this one is different. He says, He said to me, What do you see? So I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. Then he said to me, This is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to what is on this side of the scroll, and every perjurer shall be expelled according to what is on that side of it. I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it with his timbers and stones. I want you to know first of all, that the thief singular refers to the Antichrist. He comes to steal, kill and destroy. Exactly like the devil as described by Jesus in John 10 verse 10. Now the scroll. That is a very funny scroll. It is a scroll. All it says is judgment, 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 curse, 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 woe, woe, woe. So what is it talking about? Look carefully at the book of Revelations. Alright, here we go, Revelations again. Do you notice that from the time the seals are broken and from the time that uh, the rapture is completed and uh, the last week of uh, Daniel begins, that there are some famines, some wars all the time. The seven years are full of it. And uh, chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. When the first seal is broken, the rider of the White House comes forth and he brings war. That's Antichrist. He begins launching the war. In chapter 6, verse 3, the second seal is broken and there was even more war. There was peace taken away from the earth. Now if peace is taken, then peace was there. Which was there before the last week of Daniel. And in chapter 5, uh, chapter 6, verse 5. Then you open the third seal, and there's a black horse, and he represents famine. Then in chapter 6, verse 7, 
the fourth seal and he saw a pale horse he represent death and the fifth seal represent martyrs that died there were many who died and uh, then when the sixth seal begins cosmic disturbance begins the heavens and the earth begin to to move into a dimension of judgment unlike the world has ever seen I mean the seven last years are horrendous years years when cosmic disturbance are so powerfully displayed they begin a sign of it begins even towards the close of the church age remember that Peter predicts it the sun shall be turned change the moon change the blood and signs in the heavens above now even towards the close of the church we begin to see cosmic disturbances but it will be multiplied greatly in the last week of Daniel and notice in chapter 6 verse 17 which is why I believe that we Christians will not be there and the rapture has taken place because it says for the great day of his wrath has come. The tribulation years with a capital T, which is the seven years, the, the last seven weeks, the tribulation week, sometimes they call it, is a time of the wrath of God beginning. And the Bible tells us in the book of First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, that we are not appointed for wrath. We are not chosen for wrath. We are chosen to be free and redeemed. And from the time it begins, you notice wrath comes in different forms. And when the seventh seal is broken in chapter 8 of Revelation, there was a silence in heaven. And remember when I say there's a silence in heaven, you can read it consistently. Where there is silence, there is some sort of judgment about to take place. Uh, immediately after the silence, there was, even in the book of Zechariah, you will find that several times God talked about silence. And immediately after that, there was a judgment. And here there was a silence in heaven, and then there was these seven angels with trumpets. And I want you to know, those trumpets are trumpets of judgment. Verse 7, chapter 8. Of revelations. When the first angel sounded, hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. Second trumpet sounded, a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, looks like a meteorite. And a third of the sea became blood. Third trumpet was blown in verse 10, the waters were struck. Fourth trumpet was, was, was blown in verse 12, and the heavens were struck. But when the fourth trumpet was blown, in verse 13, there's an interesting, what I call, refrain that came. If the revelations was a stanza, chorus, sometimes you got a refrain. A third refrain that is different from the chorus and the stanza. In verse 13, it says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to, to sound. In other words, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh trumpet are going to be horrendous. They are going to be bringing even more woes. But notice, the woe is declared three times because there are three last woes that will come up when the three trumpets are blown, the remaining three. And when the fifth trumpet was blown, there was demonic power released on the earth like never before. The locusts from the bottomless pit represent demon spirits. Then in verse 12 of chapter 9, Rev uh, Revelation chapter 9 verse 12, one woe is passed, two more woes. Where is the second woe found? In the sixth trumpet being blown. In chapter 9 verse 13. When the sixth trumpet was blown, there are four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. They were released. Verse 15, look at verse 15. Chapter 9 verse 15. 
But four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year, so precise, all reserved for the wrath of God for the last days. They are different type of angels. I want you to understand angels. They are archangels, messenger angels. They are worship angels. I know because I've seen some of them. There is the worship angel that teaches us new songs. The warring angels don't. They have a different job to do. Then there are other type of angels called ministering angels. They are involved in helping you get a job, helping you do your business, helping you get your needs, physical needs met. They are ministering angels. Now, there is a particular group of angels. They are reserved. They are among the warring angels. They are reserved and, and they are reserved to inflict the judgment of God. Oh... Those are, don't play around with those angels. Different. Worship angels are different. I, I love them to be around me. Because worship, worship angels, angels are, are those that, that and came around you and sometimes in your dream or in vision, you could hear them singing. They are different from ministering angels. Ministering angels, sometimes, uh, uh, I don't know why is it, they, they, uh, what, uh, excuse me for using that word, Excuse me, angels. <laughs> they they sometimes camouflage. <laughs> uh, they they can, they look almost like a human, and uh, it, like they live almost like on this earth all the time, ministering to us, and uh, uh, God spies <laughs> and <laughs> send among men. And and usually those angels that come in disguise, where where the book or some of you are saying, hey, he's getting out of scripture. Wait a minute. Didn't the Bible say be hospitable lest you enter, entertain angels? Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> so, so those are angels that can come in disguise. <laughs> they disguise as human beings. And uh, there are some angels that don't have wings, some do have wings. They are different types. So these, to explain, I had to explain all that to, so that some of you don't get frightened and say, well, why did the angel do all these things? Because there's a particular group of angels, they are designed with a purpose to inflict God's judgment. And uh, here, they were reserved for that day. And uh, they were released to kill a third of mankind. Which is why you understand that when the Bible talks about the angel of, of death, it is different from Satan. Because that angel of death was not, was not Satan. Because God and Satan are not in partnership. <laughs> Don't tell me that during the Exodus, God called Satan and said, Satan, could you do me a favor? I mean, they are enemies. <laughs> and say, said, Satan, would you mind going around and kill Pharaoh? And Satan said, oh, I'll be delighted. Thanks for the opportunity, God. <laughs> this inconsistency. I believe in a theology that is, that is consistent. No, I, I don't want the theology where, where on, the, on, the, on one hand, Satan and God are fighting out. <laughs> and on the other hand, Satan and God are good pals fighting us. <laughs> that's why I call inconsistent theology and it confuses people. And that's why a lot of, of intellectuals don't turn to Christ because our theology is unsound. I believe in sound theology and logical theology. We've got to think through on all these things and, and be prepared to face arguments that are thrown to us by atheists. And, uh, so that angel of death that came through was one of these. That were released. That, that were held back. But when God released them, shoom, they come. And that angel that David saw, remember the angel that came with a plague when David numbered his, the nation of Israel against God's will in his pride? And he saw the angel, not the devil, he saw an angel with a sword drawn, ready to destroy Jerusalem. And David really was frightened. When you see one of those angels, can be frightening. Those are among the top-notch warring angels. Colonel, lieutenant <laughs> of the warring angels. So, that, that, those are God's angels. And uh, when they were released, Tremendous destruction came. And uh, <clears throat> then, <clears throat> in uh, 17, <clears throat> 
1716 and 17 changed into something else, right? It was a different area. There were also demon powers, etc. that were manifested. And then notice that we are still in the second world. The second world, as we see here, continues from chapter 9 verse 13. The sixth trumpet was blown and uh, that's when the second world begins to come. The plagues and everything. When did the second world co was completed? In chapter 11 verse 14, only in chapter 11 verse 14, was the second world completed? You see, in chapter 11 verse 14 in Revelation it says, The second world is past. Behold, the third world is coming. Now, what is the third world? The third world is when the devil is thrown out into the earth. The devil has now been uh, evicted from any authority in the third heaven. But, the devil is still the power of the air. Or he says he's thrown there. One day, the devil will be even be removed from the earthly heaven, the sky above us. Now, in Paul's time, in Ephesians 6 verse 12, and also now in our time, the devil and his, and his fallen angels set up their power in what Paul calls in Ephesians 6 verse 12, the heavenly places. One day, in the book of Revelations and in the tribulation week, the devil will be even forced out of there and thrown to this earth. And that is when the third woe is, in verse 12, chapter 12, 12, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because in, uh, <coughs> in chapter 11, verse 15, you notice the seven angels sounded. And after he sounded, he saw several things take place, the woman and the dragon, etc. And the devil coming to the earth. That's the third woe. Now in all these last three trumpets, or the seven trumpets, trumpets number five, six and seven were the worst. And all three are united together in what is called the three woes. Woe, woe, woe. And in the midst of all this judgment coming upon earth, Something interesting happened in chapter 10 of Revelation. It says that in the midst of seeing all these woes, I have to give you all the background before we go to this so that you could see the context. In Revelation 10, there was a mighty angel with the scroll. With the scroll. And the angel was so powerful in chapter 10 verse 1, coming down from heaven, clouded, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. You know what, that kind of angel? One of God's top-notch warring angels. An archangel. And he had a little book open in his hand. He set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voice. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> Sound like a western film. <laughs> and Apostle John quickly take out his notebook, right? First bang, second bang, third bang. And the angel said, John, erase that. Don't write that down. That is a paraphrase of what here takes place. <laughs> Let me read to you exactly how it took place. It says here in verse 4, chapter 10 verse 4, When the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal out the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. Now for all of us here, if you have ever read the book of Revelations like me, I have always said, Lord, what are the seven thunders? <laughs> Please review what are the seven thunders. It took me five years of prayer <laughs> to find out what the seven thunders were. 
I found out what the seven diamonds were. For additional tips. <laughs> <laughs> right for the seven thunders. Right. <laughs> I'll tell you what the seven thunders are. The Lord has revealed that. It took five years of prayer. You say, how do you pray? You see, there are certain things that I have listed down in the early days of my life that I asked God to teach me. And among them, I say, God, teach me the mysteries. I know there were seven mysteries in the Bible. And I wrote them. Please reveal each one to me. Some of them, it came in a few years. Some of them, it came only. And this one came only about after five years. Uh, I did not every day pray for it. But it was quite consistent from time to time. I reminded God. Now, the seven thunders and the angel coming down, there are certain clues here also given, which I never saw until God revealed. In verse 6, His soul by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that they should be delayed, no longer be delayed. You know what the seven thunders are? That's, that's the same scroll of judgment that Zechariah chapter 5 was one saw. The seven thunders are the seven completion of the judgment on this earth. You see, that's why we need Zechariah to unfold that. See the chronological order of Zechariah. After the two witnesses, and here comes the scroll that comes. And all the scroll has was judgment. Now let me verify it further by analysis of the word. Look at verse 6 of Revelation chapter 10. It says, that there should be delay no longer. My question is this. What delay? And what delay? You look at the context. You look at the context. There was a cry for judgment that came out quite early. The cry for judgment came out in chapter 6, verse, verse 11, 10 and 11. When the tribulation week began, a lot of a lot of blood was shed. And during that three and a half, there was a lot of blood that was shed. And in chapter six, verse ten and eleven, they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. They cried for judgment. And God said, a little while longer. Now, in chapter 10, the angel said, it will no longer, no longer have to wait. It will be delayed no longer. The last and complete judgment must come. And you notice, after everything is completed, <clears throat> everything is completed, it tells you here in verse 14 and 15 of chapter 11, Revelations, the second woe is past, behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seven angels sounded and there were loud voices in heaven. Now, look further up and you notice in chapter 17, verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled with amazement. It says here <clears throat> in chapter 16, verse 17, Revelations. Then the seven angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. It is done. Then look at chapter 19, verse 2. 
For true and righteous are His judgment. Because He has judged the great harlot that corrupted the earth with her fornication and He has arranged on her the blood of His servants shed by her. That whole harlot was there throughout the seven years of the last week. So you see the, the beginning of the judgment in chapter 6 of Revelation, the completion of it towards the end of Revelation. It's all about judgment. That's why in chapter 10, you see in verse 6, when he says no longer the clue was there. He who is wise, let me understand. When he said that it should no longer be delayed, if you search a context throughout Revelation, you would also have had a clue. But because there are so many things that are reason, sometimes we just miss it. And remember this, all truth is simple. It may be deep, but it's simple. Let me illustrate with natural things. Uh, some of you may love computers. You know computers can be very complicated, the programming, everything. And uh, there are lots of computer books in the market. But of all the computer books and authors, the one I like best is those by uh, Peter Norton. Uh, uh, his book makes it so simple that when you read it, ah, oh, it's that simple. Uh, I'm sure those of you who know computer know what well, is one of those famous authors who started and got the Norton Utilities among the best uh, two sets. But when he describes DOS and he starts teaching you about DOS from, from ABC, your computer, talking about IBM Compact, I'm sorry for you all making DOS. <laughs> Apple. Uh, I haven't gone into that area, so I can't illustrate. <laughs> but but you, you know that it can be complex as you go deeper and deeper. But there are certain computer books that start at the basic, it's so simple. Well, then there are others, I've seen many others, and, and that. that they try to describe doors and they describe this, describe that and everything and it looks complex. And I ask a lot, Lord, why is it that this is the same? Doors is doors, I mean. There are different versions but it's, it's basically uh, the, the, the language of the computer. And why do they teach so differently? Then I realized, this fellow he called Norden, because he understood it so well, he could describe it simply. But if you understood it three quarter, you describe it with some complexity. <laughs> you see, the more you understand something, the simpler you can make it. But when you don't understand it fully yourself, you can't make it simple. So truth and the depths of truth are always deep. That's why Jesus, when He teach in the Bible, in the Gospel, all his teachings looks very simple. Because he understood the spiritual life like nobody understood. When he described the spiritual life, he say, Hey, it's so clear, it's so simple. But, but yet, yet, why didn't we see it? It's the question. So, take that to heart. In anything, let's say in some of your most difficult things, some of you studying or something. Let's say some of you are studying, so I want to encourage you. I always try to encourage people of God to study hard. <laughs> Let's say mathematics, my favorite subject. You're doing calculus or something, right? Or functional calculus. It looks deep and complex. But you know the problem? Because many, many average teachers of maths, they only teach you formulas, how the formulas came about, they memorize the formulas, and that's it. But the understanding is only in application of formulas. Not the real understanding of, how, of, the, of the depths of it. But then when you actually can find a math teacher that, that understands it, comprehends it, knows how it comes about, knows what it means, you'll find that that guy can make it so simple that you just sit there and say, Huh? I know it's like that so simple. It takes something partially understood to make it complex. And it takes something completely understood to make it simple. 
That's another parable. <laughs> but uh, that's that, that's true. You think about it. It's just like music. I love m- music, and 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 sometimes uh, when we do, uh, we we also like say we teach Greek. Or when you understand it, you can make it simple. Or when you teach music, uh, written music to people who don't even know how to read music notes. I start describing it with a basic understanding of what the notes are. I don't start, oh, this note represents this sound. This note, this. You, you go deeper than that, you can make it simple. You, uh, how I teach music is like that. Just let me divert for a few minutes. You see, one day there's a man sitting under the coconut tree. He hears, he writes a note to his friend. So if he writes a note, he, 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 he writes his, his note, he could say, let's say for Christian, he writes hallelujah. Then he sends it to his friend. He says, oh, he said hallelujah. How does he know whether the hallelujah was hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah? <laughs> because the, the word doesn't tell you how high, how, lo- how low, or how fast it's spoken. Whether it's hallelujah or hallelujah. It doesn't tell you. The word doesn't tell you. So, to describe it, we English put description, we make it long, put dash, 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 or, or we put exclamation mark. But there's a better way to put it. So one day the coconut fell while he's sitting thinking what to write. How does he convey the sound to the friend? So as he wrote the little note, hallelujah, he wants to tell him about the coconut falling. He draw a coconut tree, the coconut falling down, plop. A round coconut. So he sent to his friend, his friend read the note, oh, there's a coconut there. The next day, he was sitting down, another coconut fell. Two, he said, pop, pop. So he put there two. So he said, two coconuts fell. His friend read the note, look, oh, two coconuts fell. But one day, two more coconuts fell. And that this one is ting ting and not tuk tuk. <laughs> so he draw the two coconuts higher. And so, Every time he draw it higher, it means ding ding. The higher you go, mean ding ding. He draw it lower, it means ding ding. So now he has a means of communicating sounds to his friend. The next day, three coconuts fell. This time the coconut fell very fast. A strong wind blew. Hurricane. He go up. Now he has to think. How do I tell my friend that he dropped? I could tell him now how whether it dropped on a tin can or it dropped in the water or dropped in a mud prop. <laughs> now how do I tell him that it dropped very fast? So he think and he got an idea. Now, uh, please, uh, music notes didn't actually come out that way, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's my way of simplifying it for the non-musician. See, when you understand what notes are, you could simplify in various ways for the non-musician to understand. You don't just tell them, okay, memorize. This is what it means. You tell them how it comes about. And, and when they understand how it comes about, it's easy to remember, easy to read. So one day there was this man, I said, the hurricane blew, three coconuts dropped very in rapid succession. And so he got an idea. To tell him that it's dropped faster, I put one line after the coconut. So he draw a round thing, coconut, and put a line right there, and so he communicated. This means that ta-da-da, <laughs> much faster. And so when it's very very fast, he says, "Now I must draw a, a note with a line and put a little flag there." Tell him the hurricane blowing very fast. <laughs> when it's very very fast, draw two flags. <laughs> and for musicians, you all know that that has to do with the with the uh, brief, the semi brief, the crotchet, and the quaver and the semi quaver, right? But music notes are just a language to communicate sounds. See, when you understand it and you could teach people the essence of what it means, that a note is just communication of a sound. It can be the sound produced by this or that, but it's the same sound. And if I draw, draw a line after it or whatever, it's to tell you how fast I draw it up or down, there, how, how high or how low, that's all. So simple. And... Uh, Usually, the reason uh, in the early days when, 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 when we did that, it was because we wanted uh, most of the musicians to at least be able to read notes. But this is what I mean. All truth and anything natural or spiritual, 
will always be deep because truth, and that is what science is. Look at what science is doing. They're trying to find the essence of what runs things. So when, when Einstein comes out with E equals MC squared, they say, wow, they haven't seen mass link up with energy in that state. So he wholly simplified uh, various fields. When the Maxwell equation came, that link with electromagnetic laws and electricity. And the, people, the scientists in his days would say, amazing how he could link two different fields together. See, truth is simple, whether it be natural or spiritual. But it's only simple when it's understood. It looks complex when it's not understood. I pray that give you encouragement. Whatever subject you study, whether you're math, science, or some course you're going through, or economics course, or university course. Remember this. Try to get to those books or teachers who really understand the subject. Those who partially understand make it complex. Those who fully understand can go right to the essence and they will bring out the simplicity of it. And that's where you can learn faster. Speed learning. Right. Now we go to Revelation chapter 10. <laughs> See, we see here how simple it is to understand the mystery of the seven angel, which was mysterious for so long. It took me five years. Before I see, when I saw it, I said, Lord, it's so simple. I, could, I got it by looking at the uh, no longer. But we just don't see this, those things. And so it says here in verse 6 that, uh, that there should be delay no longer. The seven thunders were the sounds that pronounce judgment. What the angel brought for was the confirmation and the establishment of the woes and the judgment that came on the earth. Which is why he asked John not to write it down. It may be too horrible for us to take it. But look at verse 7, chapter 10, verse 7. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. Now, what mystery is that? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. There's a mystery called mystery of lawlessness. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. See, there is a mystery of iniquity. And Revelation 10 tells us that that mystery has been prophesied in verse 7, has been declared by his servants, the prophets. What has John the Apostle been declaring? What has Paul been declaring? They have been saying that there is a mystery of iniquity working, how the spirit of Antichrist is already at work, and you know what the completion of the spirit of iniquity is? The manifestation of Antichrist in the flesh. Just as the, the whole panorama of God's revelation was how God became human flesh and dwell and live among us. Died on the cross, rose again, and sat on the right hand of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The mystery of lawlessness and iniquity is how the devil will personify himself in the Antichrist in flesh. And that mystery is completed. And that is why after the seven angel came, you have a description, you have a description of all those things that take place, like chapter 12, uh, the war in verse 7 in heaven, and then the third war taking place, where it says in verse 12, War to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath. That's the manifestation of the mystery. And the devil himself comes. 
And when the devil came to totally influence the Antichrist, who is already manifesting the first three and a half years, we see that there is a change that takes place and the abomination of desolation is complete. When the devil comes down, that will end, that will be right at the exact middle of the three and a half of the seven years and that will be when the woman in verse 14, chapter 12, verse 14 of Revelation, representing Israel, will be chased into the wilderness. Where the last three and a half years, the Jews, remember what Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation, flee to the mountains. And the Jews will have to flee. So, can you imagine, the seventh angel, in chapter 10, declaring, that coming to pass. And what he declared was the abomination of desolation and God's judgment that will take place immediately when those things manifest. And the wonderful thing is that in chapter 5 of Zechariah, in the sixth vision, we have it declared. Now we understand what it says. It says here that there was a scroll that came. Now that scroll, we realize that in a different form, John, the apostle, was, took that scroll, he ate it, and he prophesied to the nations. What did he prophesy? The rest of his prophecy are all judgment, as written in the book of Revelation. So we see here, in chapter 5 of Zechariah, that that scroll bears a curse. What was the curse? The curse and God's judgment on Satan and the Antichrist. That is why from that time onwards, there was a curse on the thief, the Antichrist. See, the blessing was there first. To a certain, he, he had limited authority. He had measure of authority. Look at, uh, let's cross reference here to the book of Daniel. He had a measure of limited permission, I call it. In the book of Daniel, <clears throat> chapter, 20, chapter 7, verse 25, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall, in the, and shall intend to change times and law. Then... The saints shall be given into his hands for a time. Not permanently, but for a time. So, for some ways and reasons, says here, that God permitted the Antichrist and he prospered for some time. In chapter 8, verse 25. Verse 24, 25. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy faithfully and shall prosper and thrive. Look, he will prosper in the first three and a half years tremendously. But the moment he did the abomination of desolation, the war is completed, the full manifestation, and that's when all the curses start pouring on him. Do you notice that after that, all the judgments begin to pour, that comes on uh, <clears throat> the Antichrist in the seven bowls. We call it the seven bowls. In chapter 16, all these take place in the last three and a half years. The first bowl in chapter 16 was two malignant sores. Second bowl in verse 3, the sea turns to blood. Third bowl in verse 4, the waters turn to blood. The fourth bowl in verse 8, the angel poured the bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And then in chapter 16 verse 10, the fifth angel poured the bowl on the, on the throne of the beast 
and his kingdom became full of darkness. All the bowls were poured on him during the three and a half years, the last part. And it began to be poured on him from the abomination of desolation. Which is what Zechariah chapter 5, verse 4 says, I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts, it shall enter the house of the thief. He shall enter the house, the throne, the place, the inhabitant of the thief, and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. And he shall remain there, the judgment shall remain there, until every brick timber will fall apart of the Antichrist kingdom. That's Zechariah chapter 5. The sixth vision. See how powerful Zechariah has brought us into a understanding. And of course chapter 5, verse, verse 5. The vision of the woman in the basket is simple. Because the word Sheena is mentioned in verse 11. And he said to me, Where are they carrying the basket? And he, they said to build a house for it in the land of Sheena. Sheena actually is Babylon. If your Bible has a good translation, you put it beside that, it will tell you, that is a place that is known as Babylon. So that seven vision represents the, the, the last and final rise of the ba city of Babylon that the book of Revelation talk about. Which is the Antichrist uh, Empire. Then in chapter 6 of Revelation, uh, chapter 6 of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 6, in verse 1, I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming forth. And the first chariots were red horses, second chariot black horses, third chariot white horses, fourth chariot uh, dappled horses, strong steeds. And it says here in verse 5, the angel answered and said, These are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horse is going to the north country. The white are going after them. The dapple going to the south. And all these go throughout all the earth. In verse 8, See those who go to the north country are given rest to my spirit in the north country. And uh, the reason these horses are going out is because these horses go forth. And they will bring the last gathering that comes together in the last battle which will see the crowning of Jesus Christ. Which you hear in Zechariah chapter 6 verse 9 to 10, the crowning of Joshua. So in the last and eighth uh, vision in chapter 6, we see the crowning of Joshua. And that will be Revelation 19, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes upon the earth. Now, cross-reference to Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water. During the abomination and desolation, the destruction that comes, there will be also that last and final chance to turn to God that will be given in the horses going forth. So we see the appropriate conclusion of all the visions in chapter 6. Up to uh, chapter 7. Chapter 7 begins a new phase. Now we divide from chapter 1 to 7. Actually it should be chapter 1 to 6. And then we leave chapter 7 into the second part. 7 right up to 14. Begins all a different description of the Jewish dispensation. And immediately you notice. It's like a, a, a recap, but in a different way. The emphasis is different. From chapter 7 to chapter 14, principles are emphasized. And we see uh, the main principle during those times 
is fasting. In chapter 7, it describes the wrong kind of fasting and the wrong attitude to fasting. It says here in verse 5, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, chapter 7 verse 5, When you fasted and mourn in the fifth and seven months during those 70 years, do you really fast for me? And he's talking about how their attitudes were wrong in their fasting because they were disobedient to God. And he says in verse 9 and 10, Execute true justice, show mercy and compassion everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless. Do you notice this sounds exactly like Isaiah when he talk about fasting with a true heart? The fast to set the captives free. Not the wrong fast. And then in chapter 8, again he talks about fasting. And uh, says in verse 19, Thus says the Lord of hosts, fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh month, and the fast of the ten months shall be joy and gladness and cheerful feast. In other words, they will receive the results of what they fast for fast. And in principle, they apply to the church and apply to the, the nation of Israel. The Bible tells us that in the last days, God shall pour out His Spirit. Preceding that, we have studied in the book of Joel, it's a call to fast. It's a call to seek God. As we draw near the last days, it's a call to temper our body, temper our appetites, temper our passions, so that we become spirit controlled. Then we will seek God and we will fast in the last days. The, the day of Pentecost was preceded by 10 days of seeking God. It's not mentioned, but possibly they may have fasted in the 10 days that they waited in the, on, in the upper room. I we realize here that in the last days of the church, there will be a call to fast. Jesus says the days will come when the bridegroom is taken from the bride, and then they will fast. And as we draw near the time of the coming of the bridegroom, there will be a call to fast as the book of Joel gives. And in the time of tribulation years, many also will be called to fast of the Jewish people. They will call to turn to God. To, to seek God with their heart. And then God will begin blessing them in chapter 8. And their fast will be turned into feasts. And these are the things that God said He will do among the Jewish nation. In uh, chapter 8, verse 3. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion. Then verse 8. I will bring them back. A prophecy in chapter chapter. It was 7 and 8 that is being fulfilled in our time. Because God will bring back and call, begin to call Jews to return to Israel. It will be the only place where they will be safe in the time of tribulation. It will be the only place. And so from the east to the west, God will begin to call them back. In verse 8, I will bring them back. Then the second part, verse 8. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Because it's in the tribulation week that the Jews will have the third temple to worship God. And God will be, in a sense, their God. They will restore back all the temple worship in the tribulation week. Chapter 9. Now, chapter just if you want to put some New Testament scriptures, when the fasting turned to joy, you can put Matthew 6, verse 17 and 18. Jesus said, when you fast, don't be mournful, but He says, anoint yourself. Normally, they only anoint for feasting and for party. And that goes in line with what Jesus said, your fasting should be in private. And as far as outward they're concerned, it should be a joy as you're expecting those things from God. Like in chapter 8 of Zechariah. Where He turns their fast into feasting. Chapter 9. Chapter 9, there is what I call the destruction that takes place all around, on different places. And yet there will be the blessing of God in Israel. With some prophecy in chapter 9, verse 9, about the first coming of Jesus, mentioned. But it says in chapter eight, uh, chapter 9, verse 14, Then the Lord will be seen over them, and His arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord will blow the trumpet and go with winds from the south. Now, there will be a revival among the Jews also. Because don't forget the two witnesses will be around. First, 
the first three and a half years. And it, chapter 8 tells us there are two things that God manifest, two forms of His power. In chapter 9, we see the will in. In chapter 10, verse 1, we see the rain. So when you seek God in fasting, and you seek God in prayer, you will begin to see the Spirit come like the wind and like the rain. The latter rain. Both takes fasting and prayer. Verse 1 of chapter 10. Ask the Lord for rain in a time of latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give in showers of rain, grass in a field for everyone. And he says, I will strengthen in verse 6 the house of Judah. I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have mercy on them. And in chapter 11, there is a statement made about the Antichrist. And you will notice, it says in verse 17, Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves a flock, a sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall be completely withered and his right eye shall be totally blind. All these are pronouncements of judgment. And then when it's singular, it points to the false shepherd of Israel the Antichrist. Do you know that the Antichrist will come as a shepherd to the nation of Israel as their Messiah? He will claim to be their Messiah. For the first three and a half years, Israel will be deceived. Then when he puts the abomination and desolation, desolation or abomination and desolation, they will realize who he is. Too late. So he is a false shepherd. And at the same time, there is also the true shepherd. Let's look at chapter 12. Verse 9. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for, me, for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo, Armageddon. You can see how systematic it is also taking place. There is a fasting, then there is a revival that will take place. And uh, then the Antichrist pretending to be a shepherd, but the destruction will come on him. And then Megiddo taking place. Now, let's look over at the book of uh, Revelation, chapter 16. And we see here in uh, verse 14, For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kingdom of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Verse 16, they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. There we have Zechariah the chap chapter 12, chapter 13. Confirm it. You continue to see here uh, in verse Verse uh, 8. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one third shall be left in it. I will bring one third through fire. We look at Revelation 16, verse 19. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great baby Lon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine or the fierceness of his wrath. Three parts mentioned again. Chapter 14, verse 2. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. All these are towards the end of the seven weeks, seven, seven years, the last week. The city shall be shaken. The houses rifle, the women 
women ravish half the city and go into captivity, but the remnant of people shall not be cut off from the city. Look over at Revelation chapter 19, verse 19. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. That's the last battle that you read about in Revelation 14. See, Zechariah is one of those few minor prophets that saw far out into the eschatological last week of Daniel. And let's conclude Reve uh, uh, Zechariah 14 when... The battle is completed. Jesus has won and overcome the Antichrist. In chapter 14, verse 16, it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. It shall be that who, whichever the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. And it says, here in verse 20, In that day holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses, the pots in the Lord's house. All this symbolic shall be like the bows before the altar. So it tells us here that uh, it will go into the period of, at the end of chapter 14, the millennium, the thousand year rule. You can see how far Zechariah has, has seen and has brought us through his revelation of the last things. Praise God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we praise you and we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask, O oh God, that you establish your word in our lives. And we know, O oh God, that the things in your word and the things of your spirit are for our edification. We pray, Father God, that that which we have understood may revive us as we prepare, O oh God, for the last things that you're going to manifest. May we be among the overcomers of God, fulfilling your purpose in history. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your blessings. Pour it forth upon your children. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Let's rise together. And remember that our next meeting is in a fortnight's time on the 14th of September. We're taking one week's break before we see you again. And uh, after this, for those of you who need ministry, we'll meet with you with all the other pastors on the outside of the auditorium. Uh, on the right side, on my right side here. Praise God.